in New York to start her talk. So we're gonna go with Ebony and then after that we can have questions with, with Harry. Y bueno, la siguiente charla que tenemos es con Ebony L. Haynes, que es eh, escritora y curadora y es eh, directora eh, en la Galería David Spirner en Nueva York y nos va a presentar una charla que es titulada eh, The Fetish Revisited, que es eh, el fetiche revisitado o revisado y espero que os guste. There we go. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm first very sorry I can't be there in person. I um, have some travel issues coming from the States. But I'm very honored to be invited um, to this program and um, very honored to be in the lineup of speakers. I think there's a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure if that's just coming from me. Um, if everything's okay, I will continue. Uh, apologies if there's any technical difficulties on that side. Um, I want to thank Arco again for the invitation. I want to thank um, uh, Bea and Alberto and uh, Yabi for putting this together. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be there and to see this beautiful fair in person. Uh, the topic of my uh, presentation today is titled The Fetish Revisited. And this is really, um, I'm, I'm kind of welcoming the crowd into a less formal presentation, really um, as part of my research as a curator and working towards the next show and always thinking about my relationship in particular to art objects and the display of the art object, I'm constantly revisiting my own um, trajectory and making sure that I feel clear and confident in why I'm making the decisions I'm making. Um, so for this presentation and looking at the fetish, which I will go into, I'm revisiting a 2017 group exhibition I put on entitled The Invisible Man at Marteau's Gallery. I will also lay out in depth um, the reference for this title of the presentation, which is quite important, important in how I'm mining the idea of the value put on art objects. Um, I will look a little bit at the socio-political influences on the art world at a particular moment and how it's been shaping the way we talk about art objects. And um, finally, I'll look at the exhibition and the art and, and how the artwork functions and, and gets ascribed to value in that setting. So this is really uh, an exercise for me to present some new research and hopefully get feedback um, from my colleagues. So uh, the title comes from um, J. Loren Matori's most recent publication entitled The Fetish Revisited, Marx, Freud and the Gods Black People Make. And for those who are not too familiar, um, this project looks at how objects are essentially ascribed value and that begins with the etymology of the word fetish um, and in particular how it relates to um, religion, religious objects and specific to the Black Atlantic tradition and religions that are dispersed amongst the Black Atlantic. Um, really briefly I'm gonna it's just a common story that is used often um, amongst some religious groups um, particularly um, in some native Brazil religions, uh, Santeria in Cuba, um, Shango in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and really uh, largely in the Yoruba culture, West Africa and Nigeria. Um, and the story is that issue, this God, this common story. So there's issue is these two friends are in the market and they're very good friends, longtime contemporaries, and they're just having a conversation and somebody walks in between them and it's felt as an interruption. And one of them says to the, the other friend, the first friend says to the other, I can't believe that person with the red hat would just have walked between us like that, that's so rude. And the second friend says, you mean the person with the black hat? And the first person gets very angry. It's like, what are you talking about? It's, there was the red hat that just walked right in front of us. 
And the second person there argues back and it's like, how could you not see with the, your eyes? I was right here. It was a black hat. And then issue walks back through them in the other direction. And they realize that the hat issue is wearing has one side that is red and one side is that is black. And um, it's a really interesting story for me to revisit in just thinking very basically on how certain objects viewed from different angles and from different sets of eyes are ascribed different meaning. And to keep that in mind and consider what the other viewer is thinking about when they're looking at something that I view, maybe, you know, it sounds like a very basic premise, but it's an interesting story and, and fable in terms of constructing um, value systems. And the root of the word fetish comes from Portuguese is fetiche. And um, in tradings with particularly the Guinea coast and African objects at the time, um, when Portuguese tradesmen and colonizers were, were feeling like they were being taken advantage of or not being able to barter at a certain value they deemed appropriate, they would label something fetiche, like it's bad, this fetish, you are, you are trying to give me something that is worth less than you're saying. And it, it was this really negative connotation and kind of being duped and um, this particular good is not worth as much as you're saying it's worth. Um, later we see this come back, this idea of fetish and fetishism and fetishizing an object. There are multiple meanings to this word depending on where you live in the world. But for purposes of this um, research, I took it into Marx um, along with Matori's um, trajectory in this book and the idea of commodity fetishism and how later in 19th and 20th century, we think about how value is ascribed to goods based on labor, how it might seem very arbitrary to one, but very purposeful to another. So really trying to grapple with this balance of the fetish, the fetish meaning to one group, it doesn't make sense that this has a certain kind of value or history and etymology and to another, it makes perfect sense and grappling with the tension there. I mean, Western world very clearly uses it as something just basically inappropriate. And for me, I'm thinking of what that means for the black object, but specifically this kind of conceptual black body as object, um, either very specifically visual, um, the aesthetic black body, but also the presence of the black body. And interestingly too, in this enlightenment moment and post enlightenment moment, what happens we see with, if we're, if we're basing it in the word fetish and how value is ascribed and grappled with, identity and how identity is formed, um, this kind of post-enlightenment dichotomy and framing and re really affirming whiteness strictly in opposing what is blackness. So if, if we are talking about how to ascribe value and this is the fetish, this is bad, it's natural. So the, you know, the, what is white would be technology, enlightened. You know, this is emotional. This, whatever this religion is doing, whatever these people are doing, it's based in emotion. We are based in intellect. This is the intellectual side. Um, you know, I guess, hypersexual, non sexual, really, really creating this divide and making huge exclamations of, I am not that, I am white, I am not this fetish side. And what happens then is, Black people are forced to perform a role with um, this post-enlightened envisionment of what Black men, you know, men, Black people are supposed to be versus white. They are, that is projected onto them. So they're forced to live this role, but also punished to do, in doing so in a system that doesn't support them. So fetish then informs how the self is constructed, constructed in relationship to the other. And this is an installation view of the exhibition I referenced earlier, Invisible Man at Marteau's Gallery. Um, it was an exhibition I put on with four artists, uh, Pope L, Torquase Dyson, Kayade Ojo, and Jessica Vaughn. Now, as I'm walking you through just my kind of train of thought and research as a curator, I'm, I'm often thinking back to what was going on not just with me, but in the art world and in the world at large when this, the ideas for this exhibition formed. And, you know, I'm not going to dive into the trajectory super deep with too much um, description, but 
I, I don't want to speak lightly of it, but 2012, we had the murder of Trayvon Martin very soon after we had the acquittal of his murder of George Zimmerman. We then saw, you know, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, I could go on. There were public murders of black people. And for one side of this dichotomy, this was just a reality that was uncovered and made public. For the other side, it might've felt shocking. Again, values were ascribed differently. What, what was important in this moment for some was not important for others. And there was something about the violence against black bodies and how public it was, um, so much of a spectacle and how people were given, it was very frivolous and dangerous how meanings were being ascribed to these systems and institutions that were inherently racist, but the, the argument that they weren't was still there. And, and it, you know, it brought up a lot, not just with me personally, but in our art world in particular. And in 2016, the hashtag and this movement Black Lives Matter was clearly global. And it became um, a symbol for homegrown movements who were working to fight injustices and racial injustices in particular. And to go back to our world, our little niche of the art world, it affected the voice of people who were maybe a little more invisible and a little had felt like they had a little less access to this 1% world. So galleries and museums were being called on to do more. And what that looked like in the moment felt like very reactive to me personally as a curator. Um, you know, I don't need to give this disclaimer, but this is really just, I'm open to conversation after I'm hoping to have some, but this is really just what I was experiencing at the time. I felt it was very reactive um, and largely too literal. And it, it's inherently problematic when you're asking systems to change what's on view and what people are meant to interact with in terms of art and exhibitions and ideas when those who are putting the stories forward are on a, one side on the white side of the dichotomy of the post enlightened being. And so there's just and that's not to fault my colleagues who are white at all in institutions. It's just to say you're, you're reacting in a way that you are inherently not going to be able to hit a mark that is being called on. And so for me, I'm thinking of how to avoid, you know, just speaking quite frankly, a black body very literally in the space and what it means to show the black body in a white cube um, as for me that there was a fear of it and still is a fear of things being glossed over and like everything is okay now because Carrie James Marshall sold for $18 million in auction. It must mean that there's a turn. So I've always been interested just very basically in conceptual and largely research-based practices. So for Invisible Man, I'm thinking, what does it mean to be labeled all black? And for me, this creates the beginning of what I use regularly when I'm writing through ideas of a fetishized phrase, which is why I've been mining the idea of what's fetishized. You read the term all black or you ascribe something and deem it all black for better or worse and on one side of the coin, there's something positive there, right? It's a movement in towards something that has become more visible. For my side of the, of the curatorial coin, it was a negative part of the fetishized phrase. It felt too siloed, um, uh, less rigorous for me personally. So the artists that I've chosen for this show, um, there is no literal black body in there. Um, and I use Ellison's Invisible Man as a, as a creative starting point for me thinking through what it means for black bodies to be in these art spaces. And just very briefly for people who aren't familiar with the show, the, the uh, three paintings on the long wall in the back are Tarquasi Dyson, and they look um, at migration and geography, and particularly this was speaking to the pipeline um, issues that were happening in the States and are to scale thinking about water and movement and displacement. The fountain hanging from the ceiling is Pope L. And it is a fountain sourced from a particular moment in history in America where there were colored and white fountains. Um, and it dripped um, every two and a half minutes into the, a void in the floor. The couch on the left is Kaede Ojo. Um, turned upside on, upright on its side with a sequent gown draped over it. And on the back wall are an arrangement of bus seats by Jessica Vaughn. Um, 
that were sourced from the Chicago Transit Authority and um, installed in a way that shows, you know, this was during a time of segregation and transportation in, in Chicago. So you can't actually sit on them. There are the bodies there. The, the seats themselves were actually quite, they felt very historical as objects. Um, and you could see wear and tear of this of, and the dirt and the seat and what it meant to be on the particular line. This is also very particular to segregation. This was the blue line. I won't go into it too much, just a little overview of this show. And I chose these objects and these artists in particular to see how I could bring the black conceptual body into the art gallery and, and find a balance between the fetishized phrase and the non-fetishized phrase, all black, or the fetishized body versus the non-fetishized body and object, et cetera. I'm going to look um, closer here at Kayode Ojo, just to give a little bit more of a deep dive in an artist who um, I worked with closely for some years after this show, and I'm still very interested in their practice. Uh, Kayode Ojo was born in 1990 in Cookville, Tennessee, and the, his practice began largely in photography, but has since developed into what I call a conceptual sculptural practice. Um, how objects are arranged in exhibition are just as important in, in how the objects are sourced. Uh, he thinks a lot about globalization, how value is ascribed to designer goods, the, um, you know, the bootleg object. Um, he thinks about Hollywood, glamour, how is beauty, how are beauty standards ascribed? Um, how does he feel fetishized as a black body in, in particular clothing items, sitting in particular chairs? And this was his first solo exhibition at Marteau's Gallery. It's called Equilibrium. Um, I'm going to uh, quickly just read, it's not a very long press release, but it's interesting because I, I was working on this show and thinking about this the whole time before visiting Matori, Professor Matori in, in detail. But I feel like ideas about this balance between fetishized objects was still there. Um, so I quote the press release. Equilibrium is a balance between opposing forces, a calm state of mind. In this instance, it's a movie featuring Christian Bale and Tay Diggs and the title of Kaede Ojo's first solo exhibition with Martos Gallery. While attempting to create balance, Ojo accesses the dark and light moments of glamour and excess by sourcing conventional objects and playing with the cinematic. He combines mass produced items and pop culture to mine ideas of physical beauty while also considering the objectification of bodies. Ojo creates ephemeral scenes that prop themselves up on elusive ideas and shifting values, both monetary and moral, and masks something that lies underneath. For equilibrium, Ojo has sparsely covered the gallery with intimate moments of self reflection, a scent that recalls a sweet and sore memory a near-death experience captured on film, a narrated video like something out of a PBS antique roadshow that transforms a body into internalized patterns of self-doubt. Ojo sources and lists all materials used to shape these moments and in doing so expresses, expresses the servitude of the object and creates a sense of honesty and false neutrality. There is something slightly perverse in these efforts to superficially remove bias, the presence of personal narrative in both a self-portrait and a razor blade allows for one to form their own meaning without ever being fully rid of the artist's personal method of documenting. Bodies posing in photographs become sculptural objects, perhaps less elusive, and the human body is just as palpable here as in a pair of sparkling earrings left on a table the visible and the forgotten. When we attempt to regulate emotions, balance may be seemingly achieved only because the unbalanced is regularly masked. It often feels forbidden to express true and honest emotions and cloaking or drugging states of consciousness are encouraged to keep up with social norms. Um, this is just a quick 55 second video that I think speaks really beautifully to, to the ideas of the dichotomy between who ascribes value to a fetishized object. Hopefully this plays. This is a, I would call it a gem. It is a small object made of one piece of wood. It comes from Nigeria, 
from the Yoruba. It is most certainly 19th century. It is a cup for divination purposes. If you look at this artist, he there are quite a few things which are specific to him. First of all, he turned the head to the side, which is a very unusual but very elegant gesture. Secondly, the way he carved the skull, which is thinned out, turned and sort of narrowed towards the back, is almost like Nefertiti. See the arms here, how the hands merge within the cup and kind of disappear from being rubbed for so many decades. And I think it's certainly, as an object, one of the finest divination cups from the Yoruba I know. Um, and I know I'm also coming close to time here, but just to give you um, a couple of examples of Ojo's conceptual sculptures and looking at the object as fetish and the black conceptual body. Um, how he sources the work is just as important and how it's displayed. The artist hand is very much present. Um, I can attest as a curator who's worked with him for some time that getting things just right takes probably longer than um, any painting show I've ever installed. Um, and they're very emotive, they're very emotional pieces. They're, they're rich with a clear connection that Coyote has to these works in particular. It's just as strong as a, as a portrait on a canvas, I would argue, um, perhaps sometimes even stronger. It feels very um, vulnerable at times and also dangerous in how we're talking about who's ascribing meaning. Left to its own devices, somebody might view this, uh, you know, an anal probe on top of this bar cart with perhaps something vulgar as a reference, but for Kaede, it, it means something different and it creates the space for me in playing with the looseness of how these objects and the black conceptual body specifically for these artworks and my practice, how we ascribe meaning and how we play a little loose and fast with the ability to, to open up those conversations. It's really quickly in more recent work from Kaede here, relax. Um, also, I needed, I must point to the artists, still very um, important. He started in photography, as I mentioned, and uh, photography is still a large part of his practice. And just very interesting in how um, he plays with the idea of the fetish, fetishized Black conceptual body, a bit more literally here using his own body, but also recognizing that the viewer is ascribing this meaning to these moments um, you know, a comment really on obvious rigidity in proposed gender and sexual norms, but really as a black portrait and conceptual black body, it speaks to how Matori pointed out post enlightenment dichotomy, right? And being forced to be projected onto as opposed to just being. And I have to always use a moment of presentation to point to my first favorite conceptual black artist, MF Doom. And just, I think this is just an interesting point of how other artists if you're not familiar, everyone go on Spotify after, how, how other black creative bodies use objects or think of ways to reinvent what is forced onto them um, and create different personas and different ways of presenting yourself. I hope I'm not too over time. Thank you everyone for listening. This has been really enjoyable for me to work through. I think we have time for, I don't know if everyone is listening, for one or two questions. Anyone? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, you can hear. Thank you so much, Ebony. That was very, very, very good. Anyone? No questions? No. Estoy preguntando si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, por si acaso. No? Sí, me ha interesado mucho también la iniciativa de Boni de abrir una sala de arte en New York y quería saber eh, desde aquí, desde Europa, cómo están las cosas allá respecto a, a si personas ya de color estáis cogiendo iniciativas en este sentido y os es fácil ocupar un puesto social en el arte contemporáneo. Me gustaría mucho saber cuál es la situación. Y enhorabuena. Is 
Sorry, is there a translation of the question for me? I'm going to try to translate. I think the question was um, about the situation in New York. Um, the person asking the question was saying that she's um, very um, happy to hear that you're opening a gallery in New York. And she's asking about the um, situation uh, for people of color in the States and New York, how organizing works and um, how the initiative came about, I think. Is that, yeah? Sure, the initiative new gallery. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, the initiative came largely as I as I present this this research, um, which actually will be a show coming in November in in Mexico that I'm working on. Um, it's all it's all connected for me in thinking of new ways to imagine my place as a black body in the art world and the gallery world, and also the work that I'm interested in. So I proposed this model to David Zwerner, very, again, speaking to the important understanding of what's happening around me at that time. Um, just as if we're invisible man, I, I felt a fire and a need for some kind of change in how I was thinking about art. You know, last year was difficult for a lot of us for a lot of different reasons. And I personally felt unable to continue as a gallery director, feeling like everything was business as usual. I love art. I, I wouldn't be anything but a curator or a director of a gallery, but I felt the need as a person of color to think about ways to change or, or, or see real change happen. And the first way I wanted to do that was slow things down. For me personally, I wanted to slow contemporary art down. I wanted to have a chance for any artist I'm interested in, in exhibiting and working with to have their works on view and engaged with for a respectable amount of time. Um, and I just personally wanted to create opportunities for less intimidation handedly for people of color or people who maybe have not been um, or felt welcome in the art world to, to create a space that, you know, just to, clar to clarify, the space is not exhibiting only black art. Um, it's, it's exhibiting all kinds of art, but it will hopefully create a space that people feel more comfortable, um, you know, applying for an internship at or having conversations about what it means to show a black object or black body in the space. This exists, of course, I'm not reinventing the wheel, but I, I wanted to create a different platform in New York, especially. These models exist already in Europe, um, especially spaces that afford time and consideration, which I'm very enamored with. So I wanted to mimic what exists other, you know, elsewhere in the world in New York in particular. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Sorry, because I don't have a microphone. Thank you so much, Ebony. Uh, I think that we need to, to cut it now because we're a little bit uh, behind schedule, but it's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you again for being here with us. See you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Deborah.